Welcome back to Open to Truth, a podcast all about exploring big ideas and discovering truth together. My name's Clint. Hey, I'm Tony. Welcome back. And you're going to kick us off. This is your yeah, I will. brainchild here. I was just thinking, you know, we toss around ideas for what we should do episodes on. Some of them are more obvious than others, but this is one that I don't think we've maybe talked about before. Um, but I thought we should do one on marriage because you're a married man. I am. I'm a married man as of 2015. And I I frequently get rebuked for you wouldn't not, know it not wearing my wedding ring. Do you know where it is right now? I uh, I think you mean do you know where they are right now? Oh, you have a couple. Do you? I have three. You got backups. <laughs> Why do you have three? Uh, I lost the first one within two weeks of having it mm-hmm. on a Chick Fil A tray. Tragically, after the wedding, now, I thought you nearly lost one at Kane's Chicken too. Sometime when we went. Um, I seem to remember a scramble when you were walking out of like, where's my ring? And then, I don't know, maybe, oh, I don't maybe. Know. this guy loses stuff. At chicken places. <laughs> chicken places, yeah, okay. <laughs> when did you guys get married? 2012? 20... 2011? 11. 2011. So you've been married longer than me. 10 years. We just celebrate our 10 year Jeez. over the summer. Yeah, congrats. Okay. Um, so I thought it might be worth talking about just because, well, I'm wondering... In this day and age, in 2021... Sorry, I don't wear it sometimes. I, just, I forget. You forget. It's not a protest. You're not opposed uh, to them. No, and I'm not trying to indicate singleness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just straight up forget. Yeah. I don't know how popular of an idea it is in 2021. I think it's falling out of style. Yeah. Like, it's certainly just anecdotally, it's much more common to see people living together without a commitment of marriage. And so I want to explore, I guess... What, what is it? What is marriage? What is the commitment that you're making there? Mm-hmm. And why would anyone make it? Why would anybody make that kind of commitment? Like uh, Aziz Ansari has this funny bit about like just the intensity of that commitment of like, I want to hang out with you forever. You know, like <laughs> it's, it's just like, oh, geez, until we die. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay. So um, he's a riot. He is a riot. Funny. He you is hear a riot. Him saying it. Yeah. So, so what is it? Why would anybody do it? What are maybe some of the boons? I want this to be not just because we are married. I mm-hmm. want it to be a fairly pro marriage conversation because I have now experienced some of these boons firsthand mm-hmm. and I've come to understand marriage. I'll say this six years in, it's different than I thought it would be in that what I find valuable about it mm-hmm. is maybe different than what I expected to find valuable about it. Yes, um, yes, yes. So we can unpack all of this, but maybe we start with what is it? Okay. Well, maybe even before that, there, mm-hmm. there's just this thing that you can do as a human being, and that's make vows. Yeah. You can say stuff, mouth noises. Yep. We know about those. Uh, sometimes you just say a sentence. Sometimes you just talk about things. <laughs> but other times you make promises. Mm-hmm. And, somet- and there's these really ironclad ones, even special ones, a vow or a Seems covenant. Like really strong promise. That's what it means, right? And when you string certain ones of those vows together, that's a marriage. That's a marriage. Is that right? A covenant. And so yeah. typically, like a traditional, we should have pulled that up. Like a, what's the traditional vows at a wedding? Um, oh, for richer, for poorer, for better or worse, in sickness, in health, mm-hmm. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I take thee to be my wife. Wedded husband. Yeah. Uh, to, to have and to, and to hold. hold. For better or worse, richer or poorer. That whole Sickness idea. and in health. Yeah. Forsake, it, forsaking all others. Yes. That's part of it. It is. Important part of it. Till At death, least in this state. Till death do us part. Yeah. So it's a lifelong commitment. And that's it. That's when you utter those words mm. uh, in the speech act of giving, presenting vows to the person. That, and I guess... With a witness. Well, now you're getting into like some social stuff okay, maybe, right. but I... Yeah, I don't really want to go into like legally what's a marriage and all. I'm not. No, we, no. that's a whole other topic. We could. But go when to. you do that with it's exchanged with another person, they consent. They know about it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and they agree, and they've done the same for you. Now you're in a marriage. Yeah, I think right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And you could. You and re- it is tied to like society and the the structures we have in place and it can be recognized by your government. And, yes. And I think the tradition And is, they do want you to have done something like that, like an exchanging of vows. Mm-hmm. I think even if you went to the justice of the peace, there's something, I could be wrong, but 
It's not just signing your name. What is it you're actually committing to? Yeah. You're signing a piece of paper, but what's the print above it? Yeah. It's something, a commitment of sorts. Yeah. yeah. And I think that the idea of doing it in front of your friends and family is not only so they can celebrate with you, but almost like a little bit of like accountability. Like I'm making this public declaration that I will commit myself to this person. Well, in the traditional ceremonies used to have, it's all but gone now. Mm. It used to have a portion where uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Right. So if you, if there was any issue with it, you were, like that was they, the moment of accountability. Like, yeah. If you knew they're already married and they actually can't mm-hmm. marry, like or speak they're up. A, being, they're being unfaithful or whatever. And you, yeah. that's the time to point it out. Yeah. Now, if you think better of it later on, you can still talk about it. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. not like... It's well, totally I didn't ab- say it. It's so totally absolved now. I'll just let it ride. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's that's what it is. Um, and But why? Crucially... Why such a thing? Or It's not... It is not a... This almost goes without saying, but... Your understanding of the kind of love that you are committing yourself to, like it, it, it needs to be an agape sort of a love. You are not, you're not making a commitment. Like I've heard this in ceremonies. I promise I'll never let you down. I promise I'll always make you feel good or whatever. And it's just like, what's the point of even saying that? It's so obvious that you're going to fail one week in, one day in. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, there's a commitment to. Yeah, dude. Wow. What what is it you're committing to? You're not you're committing to all <laughs> I wanted to say you're committing to always act in their best interests, but I failed at that. So if that's what I was attempting to commit to, I have not been perfectly loving, obviously. I have committed to um stay in relationship with I this guess person. And the traditional words I think the only ones, the verbs are to have and to hold. To have and to hold until we die, which is (laughs) Aziz Ansari's point. Like, you're mine and I'm just going to hold you until we're gone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Totally, man. So when I think about what it is that I have committed to, I I have committed myself to pursuing agape. Okay, maybe this. Building a life together? Is that mm, yeah. too generic? Yes. Uh, well, no, I don't think it's too... I think it's helpful. Already, my life has been... My highest value, I think, is this agape. I'm trying to be formed in the image of Christ. And what is really helpful is to have a domain of practice that is consistent and regular, day-to-day. Uh, and what our marriage has become is a place where both Melissa and I are able to grow and exchange love, practice it, get better at it, um, offer it, receive it. And uh, with an understanding that even when the other person is acting at their worst, I'm in this. I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going to just run off when things get difficult or when you stop giving me what I need or when you stop making me feel good. Um, Mm-hmm. there's something bigger that we're trying to build here. And here's a point that only hit me somewhat recently that I think is interesting. I've been reading this book, um, book about marriage by Tim Keller. And he raises the point that like, when you get married on your wedding day, you really don't know who you're committing to because people change so much that 10 years from now, the person you wake up in bed with may be very different than the person that you stood at the altar with. Now, metaphysically, we want to say that the same person yeah. is still responsible for their crimes and all of that. But I have seen at least in, even just in myself in the last six years, I'm very different than I was when we got married. So at some point and to some extent, one day you will wake up next to a stranger or at least you will wake up, strangers may be too strong a word, but you will- Well, con- stranger is a two-place relation. It's, I don't know you. Yes. And hope that is tragic. And that's, you made mistakes. Sure, sure. Wake up to someone, just your point, different than at the beginning. And that will consistently happen. That will keep on happening. Mm -hmm. Where it's it's your fault in a way, partially, that they've become a. Right, right. Something's gone wrong in your marriage if suddenly you're confronted with a stranger in your bed. Yeah. Right. Um, But it's. You fail to grow together. Grow together. That's what I wanted to say. It's a commitment to grow together. And to try to help the other person grow with an understanding they're going to help you grow. 
Um, and I, I almost can't overstate the value of that. I mean, when I, I'm so appreciative, even in this season, now that we've got a little boy and we're here with a newborn and I'm thinking, gosh, there are folks who are single parents. I don't know how they do it. If that's you, God bless you. That is, that's tough. I mean, to be alone, um, and handling something like a newborn, it seems to me very obvious that it's a team activity and like, it's very helpful to have somebody else there. Um, throughout the whole thing. So I've become so appreciative of how useful it is to have somebody who is with me day in, day out, who I can't BS, um, like someone who will call me on stuff, you know? Mm. Uh, and, and there's a lot of ways that we improve each other. Like we make each other better. I don't know if your experience is the same in your marriage, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, to have a a reliable partner that's that is doing life with me, an ally through thick and thin, is I I can't put a value on it. Well, really. that's the whole. I mean, it gets back to like the what is marriage because it is these these binding vows, and of course, in our culture, there are no fault divorces, mm -hmm. and, and you can just you could just opt out basically and divorce someone, right. and leave them, and but. What you're, what the hope is, the promise is, is that I'm not going to run away when the going gets tough or a, a hard day. And so there is a little bit more of a space or freedom for someone to speak in yes. to your life and say things you may not want to hear. Yep. And hopefully it's done in a tactful way. Yeah. It doesn't have to be abusive. Right. Of course, it shouldn't be, but. Um. No, you're absolutely right. Like I found... I don't know, Melissa and I dated for quite some time before we got mm -hmm. married. We dated for what, five, six years or something before we got married. So we had a- Have you now been married longer than you dated? Yeah, about the same time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so been together for 12 years, which meant that heading into the marriage, there weren't really surprises for us in terms of what we were going to have conflict about. We had a pretty good idea of the contours of like where we disagree or our values are different and where we might butt heads and that sort of thing. But what it did for us was when we were dating and would have conflict- there was a sense of like, oh, is this it? Is, is she going to leave? Am I going to leave? Is this the last straw? And so sometimes you, I don't know, you hold your tongue maybe or you don't quite say the whole truth or whatever it happens to be to try to not rock the boat so much. Mm -hmm. Here in marriage, there's an understanding like she's not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. So we can either be unhappy together or we can just try to work on this with, with the sort of security that like, I can tell you what I really think without worrying about you then just leaving me and blowing the whole thing up. Now, just to, like devil's advocate or just being really honest mm. for the uh, folks that disagree with the whole enterprise, like wh I guess why, I get into the why. Mm. Why do? Why not just leave if it gets hard enough? Like, who can Okay, yeah, you made a vow. Probably shouldn't have done that. It doesn't feel good. Maybe you feel like your integrity is lower if you were to bail, but... Okay, you'll get over it, man. Just if it gets bad enough, bail. And I'm not. I'm not saying the grass is greener somewhere else. Yeah. But just you don't have to stick it out. Yeah. Just you don't have to get remarried or find another one. Just yeah, be done. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it gets tricky because like it. It's easy to sit here and talk a big game about sticking it out when the going gets tough. Mm -hmm. But if there's something severe like unfaithfulness or like we haven't dealt with that. Mm -hmm. But man people have and some people get through it i don't know if i personally would have the moral fiber to be able to mm -hmm. and that would be moral fiber i think it depends on the situation yeah i think it depends because it could i could totally see where it's just it's cowardice and mm -hmm. you're, you're afraid of blowing the thing yeah. up and are they repentant you're just going to be abused over and over and, and sure there's plenty of situations where there's like actual danger physical violence that sort of thing yeah, horrific. and the the cure isn't like stand there and get hit repeatedly and just offer agape. Like, no, go get safe, call the police, mm -hmm. <laughs> set some boundaries, you know. Um, so I don't want to paint that rosy picture. Or there even, but what about the more um, like chilling kind of, maybe those are chilling enough, but uh, on the side, I just, oh, I don't like that. I don't like them anymore. I just, maybe the, maybe the stranger scenario. Oh, well. Like you haven't in properly invested or grown together. Yep. And now for whatever reason, you find yourself... Uh, I don't like them. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm, I am not at all self-reporting my marriage. <laughs> right, I'm right, just right. saying like. No, but this happens, right? Where mm -hmm. especially if kids leave the home, 
you've been married 20 something years and throughout that period you haven't been investing in your relationship you've just been sort of managing a household together and you have both grown so much that you've grown apart that totally happens uh mm-hmm. and I, I don't know i think sometimes i hear of sex we haven't talked about sex yet sure, but dead um, bedrooms dead bedrooms uh wings of the house i know c- couples uh, that kind of they don't really interact within the house, but it, ha- it just makes fiscal sense for them to remain. They're, just, they're business partners. So they're doing life together for practical financial reasons, mm-hmm. but the love is gone. The friendship is gone. Yes. I think the friendship is important. Even that... Mm-hmm. I, is it a marriage if you're not friends? Well, I think so. I mean, when you go back to... You said, what is it? Yeah, and yeah. It's the exchanging of vows. Yeah, yeah. Certainly not. You can have a good one. You can have good or bad ones. Yeah, yeah. And that would be a bad one. Yeah. So your question was why stick it out and with someone that you don't like? I guess so. It's like um, how binding should you take the vows, I guess, is another way of framing it. Mm -hmm. Like I get that we made those commitments, but is it just my own integrity that's keeping me in? Does that make sense? Like what I'm asking, does that even make sense? Or um, what's like, the, like what's on the pain ethic of what? On, or, yeah, I guess. Or what ethic is being brought to the table? Is it one where I just keep the promises I make and that's what's holding me in? Or is it I want to have an enjoyable, happy life? And so to the degree that the marriage brings me that, and it takes work on my part and all this investment, then I'll stay. But, but if when for whatever it becomes reason, not worth the candle then i mean screw the promise i made okay Mm. it was 20 years ago and i didn't bear i didn't know this would happen well and right right right. under false false contract that's null and void (laughs) yeah or to your point or or what we said earlier about how different of a person you are than you were 20 years ago when you made those vows Mm -hmm. um yeah i see it's easy for me to sit here and say because i do think this that there is there is value in acting in someone's best interests despite uh, whether or not they deserve it or whether they've been making you feel good or whatever it happens. There's something virtuous about the practice of loving some, choosing to love somebody even when you don't feel like it. Mm-hmm. In fact, those are probably the key times when you should practice that. The, when you least feel like loving the person, it's probably when you most need to choose to do it easy for me to say that having not been in a 20 year marriage where we've grown apart and you've come to really resent this partner. Like I know couples who it's almost like an abandonment thing where maybe one person really wants it to work and the other person's just like, I can't stand to even look at you, you know, Mm -hmm. let alone touch you. And I think we encounter these stories more so than other in other fields. Like we're pastors at a church and I hear some of these stories quite a bit and it's like, what should we do? Yeah. And the actual answer, which is snarky is like, go to visit doc Brown and borrow his DeLorean. And once it gets it up to 88 miles per hour, then you can go back in time and fix all the ways that you screwed up. You've created this problem Mm -hmm. and there is no elegant solution Mm -hmm. from your misdeeds over 20 years of these quiet little slights. Yeah and disappointments and bad communication and it's missed just expectations built up over time there, yeah now there isn't anything you can really do you yeah. hate each other yeah so like what so then should we stay together like at each other's throats yeah you're asking me to assess whether like it to your point now i get what you mean like it's barely even a marriage yeah like you're not you're not living out the vows that you Yes. You almost in a way have already divorced. Yeah, you've already neglected you've broken your commitments. Your vows. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't to have and to held. Yeah. So now it's just like now it does feel like you might as well just it's a for, it's on paper. Go sign the papers yeah. and make it official. But, you but you're sh- living out a divorce. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, that's I like that. Yeah. Cuz it does take What do you think about this? It does kind of take two, right? Or in the situation where you've got one person who's still like, I want this to work, I want to make it work, and the other person has just been 
whether it is through 20 years of neglect or snarky comments or the amount of hurts that have been built up, is, do you think, and you can't really answer, it's probably situation to situation, can that sort of thing be overcome with persistent love on the part of the one person who wants it to work? Or... Can they only do so much? And it, it's up that to That is the thesis of the movie, uh, The Love. Fireproof? Or, fireproof. Yeah. And the Love Dare. Love Dare. Right. Yeah. 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 That that's, is a nice, what that's a nice thought. I mean, that's what and, I'm wondering. Uh, it's certainly, I wouldn't call it, um, it's not foolproof. No. No, no. Know? Well, uh, I'm just thinking, it's in, not a guarantee. Like, as a Christ follower, I do think the gospel is this news that God loves us in spite of our shortcomings. God loves us even when we, we reject him or when we don't deserve it. There is this sort of generative uh, pursuing love that eventually has won me over and I think wins people over. And so I could see how on a smaller scale that could play out in a marriage where mm -hmm. one person is resistant and gradually over time through genuine heart change on the other party to be like, okay, I'm going to love this person as best I can. Maybe over time you start to win them back or you start to... Maybe, and that's a, that's a nice thought or a hope, but I think the re the if you're going to really counsel someone to do that, their reason would have to be a more internal commitment to this good news ethic. I agree. And like they may not ever ch have the change of heart. Yeah, yeah. Just like some people don't toward God. Totally, totally. And, that's and I think there's situations where that is not the answer. And like we said, if there's like the a, abuse extreme, and that's like... Yeah. No. Um, don't just. But the stand. more the more mild, like just discontented lives. Yeah. Or like I I I wonder how many marriages there are out there that just maybe it's not animosity. It's just not. It's not anything. It's you've just drifted apart to you like you're saying. We live under the same that's roof. That's what I was imagining. We split the bills. We don't really talk. Just mm -hmm. kind of doing our own worlds. And yeah. it's okay. I know some that um, aren't don't live together. Mm. I, I know someone in my wife's family that they're married. They have, they haven't lived together for like 17 years. They marry file jointly for tax purposes and oh, very pragmatic. They date, yes. but I mean, and, that, and now we're getting to the part where like the legal versus like the mm -hmm. actual, um, I don't know the spirit of it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Cause they're, they're legally married. Like that hasn't been, changed but mm -hmm. in no way are they playing out married lives yeah, so i right. consider them divorced in my mind yeah you know i don't really think of them as cheating on each other yeah by doing these dates like no they're they're separated you know that, yeah I, I guess we touched on it a little bit you were saying like the spiritual formative like why do it at all um mm -hmm. maybe i mean there's a lot we could talk about there's uh why has this been a thing that people do yeah i mean i get what it is that we could give these promises but why did we do it um and why and maybe beyond just the the ancillary like it's economically helpful the division of labor a household mm -hmm. but i feel like there's something petersonian that i want to tap into about like it's just kind of like the way that a good human life goes mm. that you should find like a, we're, we're just built for it a soulmate of way. sorts to build your life with that's how it's meant to be it's not purely a social construct that was carved out yeah. it's just part of, you know i'm not articulating like it, it well. is it like it's part of human nature or something. It belongs to the nature of man to marry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, here, how about this? Let me just, this is total like conjecture. Okay. But awesome. Can be, that can be fun. Sometimes. Yeah, it is. Usually. Shooting from the hip. Yeah. So even like, just even like, let's put aside spirituality, religion, it's just raw evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. And I want to produce progeny mm -hmm. to pass on my genetics. That's maybe going on. That's the sub, the subliminal part and then on the surface it's playing out as like i want children to invest in and mm -hmm. to see them grow up okay and maybe it just turns out that that better happens when you have someone else to help care for it mm. like it's not just um the 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 
the selection that happens for evolution, I think n- not only just as like, can I impregnate? Right. But can I produce progeny that live and also yes. impregnate? Right. So it needs to live, the offspring needs to live to adulthood. Yep. And so, and we need to eat, we need shelter, we need clothing, mm-hmm. and the, let's just go out on a limb and say that the male body is really, really good at some of the hunting and physical, on on average, yep. better than the female body. And the female body just happens to be just really, really good at caring for... It's really equipped for that. ...babies. Yeah. In fact, there's built-in food mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of makes sense that we would kind of pair up. So we were off in the jungle and we mated and you became impregnated and that's my offspring. I want to take care of it. And... I want to take care of you because you can take care of it and we should hang out for a while yeah. because this thing needs to grow up into adulthood. It basically is helpless for the first years and years and years. Mm-hmm. But while you're taking care of it, you can't go out and run down the mastodon. Yeah, I can with my friends Yeah, and we'll actually kind of form a little circle of huts so that uh, you can do the berries and you can do the weaving and you can switch off. And when one's going eh, eh, and you one's watching them and you mm-hmm. can kind of do this, you cobble together a little society and there's these little units. I follow you on and, that. And it's just kind of eventually emerges and it becomes ensconced in law and in religious traditions. But people were pairing up to have offspring. What I don't, no, is how that accounts for forsaking all others yeah on that story why monogamy and not polyamory why not why not the same man impregnates 12 women and hunts? i think it did a yeah lot. i think i think you're probably I think right a lot the chief yeah the do, the top of the hierarchy male yeah didn't have his way consensually so then mono- or, and when does monogamy come on the scene then is that a is that a relatively late development or have they have they existed alongside each other for a long time? Some people have many wives. Some people have one wife. I do want to say that there is a biological drive toward monogamy. I don't think that our feelings of jealousy, mm. like you said mm-hmm. earlier, I can't imagine coming back from infidelity. Right. Why? Why do you care? Because you, you don't want them. I don't know. It's yeah, hard to explain. Uh, it is hard to I explain. I don't want another man to touch my wife. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God help me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's going on there? Is that purely just the way you were raised in the culture? Yeah. Like Monogamous I, culture? Like I've just been taught to be uh, In fact, by that? and I get that culture can influence our psyche in a deep way, but there's something really primal about it mm-hmm. that even just to imagine it, but certainly to if I were to see it happening oh my and a guy going to town on my wife. That's yeah, upsetting. Yeah. Very, very upsetting in a visceral, primal way. Yeah. That I'd think is separate from culture Mm. Uh, interesting yeah and maybe so bold to uh through the act of copulation yeah there is some kind of hormonal exchange or release yeah and bond and binding and uniting as the scripture put it the two shall become one flesh Mm -hmm. that just kind of that's like an imprinting yes yes yeah yeah and I think that might be the roots for this longevity monogamous setup. Yeah. Both parties feel that way about the other. Mm-hmm. And something something is broken. Mm-hmm. If yeah. and even um and even the exception to that, like the polyamory situation or the chieftain, kind of persists to this day. Like even in common lingo, people will talk about like, well, who's on um like the cheat list or like a hall oh, pass yeah, yeah, thing. Hall like pass. They'll joke about like, oh, if Chris Hemsworth, Thor, if I ever get a chance, like... Free pass, yeah. Yeah, yeah, free yeah. pass. So that idea, for, for whatever reason, there's something like less... I am less bothered, actually. Are you by Chris? By Chris Hemsworth <laughs> than I am a neighbor fellow. Because there's something about the hierarchy. I, I just it's can a, see you that. You yield to Chris. Like, I get it. You're the chieftain. You're the silverback I get gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man. I can see it having roots in deep 
human human history and yeah. then yep i think what society said was come along what already was there yes and made articulate it yeah. here's what we're already playing out this is the petersonian stuff yes. here's what we're already acting out now we're going to name it mm -hmm. and describe it yes but first we acted it out yeah mm -hmm. yeah interesting well is that and so the mo I guess the motivation to do that is I find it in my, I've just wanted to do it and I don't. And so I resist the notion that you just wanted to, cause you had Christian monogamy drummed into your head from when you were a yeah. kid. Yeah. I think it's just kind of how I'm wired as a male yep. to want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And even the, and, and it's kind of a, um, a goofy little trope to suggest that, well, evolution would suggest that you just want to, have sex with everything that walks or something. Mm -hmm. There's something to that, like just the sexual libido and drive of human beings, sure. but uh, more so males probably. But I think the more precise idea is I want my children to flourish. Mm. And one strategy could be uh, have sex with thousands of women and some of them will make, a bunch of them will make it to adulthood through yeah. random chance kind of <laughs> just... Hope that hope it works out. Just the like normal, normative Cha distribution. Like Wilt Chamberlain. Who knows how many kids that guy? Had. Yeah, yeah. Um, Genghis Khan. Right. Um, but or another strategy could be: Oh, I could really invest in this one family and be, hang out there all the time, be a part of it, help my wife, and help raise them. And that has a really high percentage chance of seeing it through to mm -hmm. fruition. Yeah, yeah. Even on the sexual pace. I'm not so sure that, you know, on that that biological argument of you just what you want is to spread your seed as far as you can. I'm not sure. What you might want is peak sexual experience with a partner who knows you and who you know well and who you have both learned with for a lifetime. Like I don't know that more sexual partners means more sexual satisfaction. Oh no. I I agree with you totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't. Uh, but I don't. Just from the bio, the evolutionary perspective, I don't know if selection trades on that. Oh, like, sure. I don't know if that's uh, sure. I don't. Okay. Maybe it is. Maybe someone could give a good argument why that's like adaptively advantageous. Right. I agree that in the vision of the good life, right, that uh, wide and shallow sexual experience. Is not as is good not as the way. so singular and deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's maybe another podcast. To yeah, dive in actually, to why be. that is might but, be. Yeah. Uh, a, I think. How about this, man? How about for those marriages that just aren't maybe going so well for whatever reason? There's some area like finances or sex or something that it's just a real challenge and you're wondering whether it's worth staying with it. Mm. A big difference too is like, do you have kids? And mm. I, I'm, I think I'm in the camp that thinks it's really, really good for kids to live in the home with their biological mother and father. Yeah. And so that's at least a, to me, that's a reason enough again, barring the crazy abusive situations mm -hmm. to stick it out and to work on it. Mm -hmm. That's mm. another reason. I think I think that's another reason why we should encourage marriage and encourage healthy ones. It's yeah. the best place for our next generation to yeah. to grow up in. And by not just your own personal search for love and significance. Yes. You know? Right, right. Yeah, I think the next generation depends on healthy marriages. Which and by healthy we don't mean conflict free, we don't mean stress free. Nope. Uh because part of what is so helpful, I think, for kids, and this is what I appreciate about my parents, um, seeing conflict appropriately modeled and communication appropriately modeled in the confines or the boundaries of a solid commitment to one another. That's mm -hmm. so helpful for kids to see that playing out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, but I, again, I can imagine marriages where it is not healthy conflict that the kids are seeing. It's like, it's very unhealthy conflict and... I just, I hesitate on a podcast to say, to give any kind of advice of what any one person should do. Like, right. Your, your situations are so idiosyncratic. Totally. totally. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I just feel like marriage gets kind of a bad rap, at least in TV and movies, the old ball and chain and kind of making jokes about losing your freedom and all of that. There's so much upside, though, that I just wanted to give a voice to. Mm -hmm. I've, again, I'm just feeling particularly appreciative in this season. Um, times when um, I've been at the end of my rope to, to have someone there um, and vice versa, to be able to be there for each other. There's, there are great benefits to it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're engaged, if you're about to get married, it's awesome. Um, don't let people scare you. It can be great. Right. Yeah. Very good. All right. Uh, so much more to say on the topic. But, yeah, there is. And different. But I feel like to say more things would like just opens up a whole other I agree. arena. So we'll cut it there and yeah. be future episodes. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. All right. Well, if you want to write into the show, you can do that mailbag at opentotruth.com. You can also leave a comment on this video if you're watching on YouTube. Um, we'd love to hear from you and interact with you. So let us know what you think and uh, what you're thinking about. And stay curious. <laughs>